Uh, members, thank you for volunteering to be on the planning committee. Or well, being chauffeured into it, one way or the other. Uh, welcome back to uh, some of you, and uh, welcome to the new people on the committee. Um, welcome back to Vicky, um, who is our minute taker. Um, for the maternity leave, she's back with us, and uh, I'd like to note our thanks to Brenda for her contributions uh, last year. Um, I also have the announcement that this will be um, Keith Rogers' last uh, planning meeting. So I'd also like to thank him for all his efforts at the planning committee meetings and for the council in general. So thank you for that and best of luck in your new ventures. Uh, thank you to Chris Meaden who is uh, deputising for yeah. Steve Fags this evening. Okay, um, so uh, my name is Councillor Anita Leach and I'm the Chair of the Committee. My role this evening is to ensure that the Committee runs smoothly, having regards to procedure, behaviour and ethics. To explain who the rest of the people on the table here tonight are, to my immediate right is the Council Solicitor, who will give advice to the Committee on any procedural or legal matters that might arise. To my left are the Council's Planning Officers, Highway Engineer and Environmental Health Officers who will present the applications this evening and give any technical advice to the Committee that may be sought. The rest of the people who you see down both sides of the tables are the elected members who will consider the applications this evening and to make the decisions. Before each application is considered there will be a short presentation by the Planning Officers. In the event that an application has received a qualified petition signed by 25 signatures or more, one representative of the petition will be invited to address the committee in support of their petition for up to five minutes. If a petitioner addresses the committee, then the applicant or their agent will be invited to make representations to the committee in support of their application, again for up to five minutes. However, if a petitioner has not addressed the committee, then the applicant or their agent will not be invited to make any representations. A ward councillor can address the committee in relation to an application. The ward councillor may speak on behalf of the residents. However, once the ward councillor has returned to the public gallery, they may not return to take part in any debate that may be followed by the committee. The application will then be open to debate and discussion by members of the Planning Committee who will then make a decision on the application. The order of tonight's agenda may vary subject to the numbers of people who are here in relation to a specific agenda item and subject to the Committee agreeing to the order being varied. If a site visit is requested and approved by the Committee, then that matter will not be discussed any further this evening and anybody here for that application will be welcome to leave. Members, can I have approval of the minutes on pages 1 to 6? Yes, I'll be Okay, do you have anybody can second that please? Thank you Ian. Are there any declarations of interest? Yes, yeah. Tony? Uh, agenda item 8. I had ongoing dialogue as a ward councillor with some of the residents of that particular building, so I will be returning in this first. Thank you, Tony. Are there any requests for site visits? Stuart? Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Uh, if I may, uh, make two requests. Um, the first for agenda item number 5. Uh, the land at Acre Lane uh, and the side of Bromba. Um, this could be a lot of public um, interest uh, in, uh, in this particular application. It's a major application. Um, I think we've all seen emails uh, on from ward councillors and residents. Um, I think it may, may, may be um, help our decision making process if we were to visit the site um, to take a look at the uh, issues first. Um, um, if I may also chair request a site visit for 25 sites in Old Oxton. Um, there's a couple of issues of concern which they can only be properly appreciated. I've seen the situation on, on site. Uh, I'm not convinced.
with submerging distances uh, that are laid out in, in policy of being met and what the impact on that would be to the coach house, um, which is adjacent to 25 cities in there. Um, so for those reasons, I'd request those two visits. Thank you, Stuart. Could I just ask members, are you happy to approve those two site visits? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. So, anybody who is here today for uh, Lander, Acre Lane and Meadowside Road and uh, 25 Slaty Road, Oxton, we won't be discussing those any further this evening. Uh, we would normally have a site visit the Tuesday before the next planning committee. Um, and the details will be on the rural.gov website under the planning portal. Okay, so if anybody would like to leave now, please feel free to do so. And I'm sorry we've dragged you out here, but we obviously can't make that decision until we've got the full committee. <coughs> I've got for agenda item 7 and agenda item 9. Is there anybody else here for any other planning application? Uh, yes. Which planning application are you here for? Uh, it's uh, number 9, uh, 52 Oxton Road, Birkenhead. Yeah, yeah that, that was one of the ones I mentioned. Yes. Agenda item, sorry, 7 and 9. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Uh, with members' permission, can we take agenda item 7 and 9 first and then revert to order? Yes, Okay, so if we can go to um, agenda item 7 then, please. Um, Matthew, can we have a presentation? The uh, Planning Commission has sought the erection of two semi detached dwellings. The houses have been designed to read as a single dwelling when viewed from Clifton Road, with the entrance to one dwelling fronting Clifton Road and the entrance to the other to the side. This would reflect the scale and size of other properties in the road. There is a mix of house type in the locality, with semi-detached properties immediately to the north, a small terrace of dwellings immediately to the south, some flatter developments at Brook Court and Hollybank Court and detached dwellings located on the western side of Clifton Road. Following consultation with the Conservation Officer, the scheme has been amended to ensure the development ties in with the character of the conservation area at large. The design is now significantly less modern in appearance and more traditional to reflect existing housing stock along Clifton Road. The density of housing at this, at this southern end of Clifton Road is higher than that further north and the proposal would be comparable to other adjacent plots. The development is set back to maintain the building line along the Clifton Road frontage. In achieving this, the rear elevation does not achieve the 21 metre separation distances that would normally be sought <coughs> in relation to properties on Rodney Street. The distance is 15 metres at its closest point measured against dwellings along Rodney Street. However, the character and relationship of properties fronting onto Clifton Road and those fronting onto Rodney Street is that none of these properties achieve the standard interface distances, with separation becoming markedly shorter as you move northerly up Clifton Road. Number 37 and 35 Clifton Road are located 12 metres from the rear of properties on Rodney Street, whilst 39 and 41 are 16 metres and 18 metres respectively. Given the character of the area and the fact that there is a shortfall in separation distances along the length of Clifton Road, with many properties markedly closer than the proposed development, it is considered that it would be difficult to sustain a reason for refusal on this basis alone. Three trees will be removed at the rear of the site. The Council's tree officer has reviewed the submitted a borough cultural method statement and visited the site, and has noted that the three trees to be removed offer limited amenity value within the conservation area, and their removal would not significantly harm the character of the conservation area. 
Off street parking is provided for each dwelling together with private immunity space. The proposals are recommended for approval and there is a qualifying petition of objection. Thank you, Matthew. Can I just point out to members at the top of page 41 in this application, it does say the proposal is for the erection of a detached dwelling. As you've heard, that is for two semi detached. So just to clarify that point. Thank you. Um, we do have a qualified petition. Is the lead petitioner here to speak on this? No? Okay, is so the Royal Council here to speak on it? No? Okay, then I can open this up to committee, please. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I do have some concerns about this application in terms of its, its impact. Uh, on the conservation area, Clifton Park Conservation Area. I'm sure many members will be familiar with Clifton Road, but it's, it's very unique uh, in this part of Birkenhead. It's dominated by grand scale villas dating back to the 1840s and 50s, set in very large grounds. Uh, the original conservation area appraisal said that Clifton Park is of particular importance because of the overall architectural quality of the earlier housing and the spacious nature of the plots and also the conservation area designation is important not only to protect the buildings from demolition but also their setting so that, that's the key point there it's, it's, uh, it's something I'd, I'd encourage members to, to think about is that, and you can actually see it up from the map at the beginning of the, of the report you can see that there's a very open aspect to the street and that's a crucial part of its designation as a conservation, as a conservation area so I've had a look at the relevant advice from the National Planning Policy Framework and paragraph 132 says when considering the impact of a proposed development on the significance of a designated heritage asset, great weight should be given to the asset's conservation. The more important the asset, the greater the weight should be. And I would argue in the context of this part of Birkenhead, this is indeed um, a very important heritage as asset, the, the conservation area itself. <coughs> Now, if you read the officer's report, it's clear that a lot of weight has been given to the design of the proposed new houses, but relatively little, I would say, uh, to the loss of space, which is a key characteristic of this part of the conservation area. So the, the next paragraph in the NPPF says, where a proposed development will lead to substantial harm to a designated heritage asset, local planning authorities should refuse consent unless it can be demonstrated that the substantial harm or loss is necessary to achieve substantial public benefits that outweigh that harm or loss. Now that's clearly a subjective matter whether this application would lead to substantial harm to the conservation area, but the important point to note is that if approval is granted here, uh, it would be very difficult, I feel, to refuse subsequent applications that seem to develop the many other open spaces uh, on Clifton Road. So, the precedent we set here tonight is very important for the future of the conservation area. But even if you did consider that the harm to the conservation area is less than substantial, uh, paragraph 134 of the National Planning Policy Framework says, where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal. Now here, all the benefits accrue to the, the applicant the applicant, uh, but the key public interest test is clearly the preservation of the conservation area. So I therefore argue that there are clear grounds for refusal on the basis of the impact to the conservation area, particularly its open aspects. Um, I do have wording uh, for refusal, uh, which I'd be happy to move subsequently when other members have had, have had their say. Okay, thank you, Pat. Uh, I think uh, just for uh, new members of the committee, obviously we have to treat each application on its own merits. Um, so if we, the fact that we've approved one thing in a row doesn't mean to say we would approve it um, for every other household within the road. Um, but uh, of, of course we have to take each application on its own merits. And in terms of uh, the design, uh, we've got an amended design here to keep the <coughs> keeping with the conservation area. We 
Okay, any other members want to speak? David? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to, so we can understand the context of this particular application on the factory area, could we just throw up a layout plan as well to show how it is located on the site itself? You've seen the elevation, which is very helpful. We now need to let's look at the layout on site. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? <coughs> no. Okay, um, Pat, can I refer this back to you then to hear your reasons for refusal? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the, the wording would be that the proposed development would, by reason of its cramped appearance and proximity to the site boundaries, constitute an overdevelopment of the site which would fail to preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the Clifton Park conservation area. As such, the proposals are contrary to policy CH2, Development Affecting Conservation Areas, and policy HS4, Criteria for New Housing Development, having particular <coughs> regard to criterion 1 and 2 of that policy, together with the principles of the National Planning Policy Framework. Thank you, Pat. Do I have a seconder? Thank you. Um, all those in favour of refusal subject to what has just been read? Those against? That's lost 6 7. Um, so, if we can move to the substantial motion, please. The officer's recommendation is to approve this application subject to the conditions listed. All those in favour of. Sorry, do we have a mover first of all? So George and uh, Ron, all those in favour of approval? Against? That item is approved, thank you. If we can now move to agenda item 9, please, which is uh, pages 53 to 58 in your packs. Can we have a presentation please, Matthew? Commission is sought for the change of use of these premises to use as a restaurant. Consent is also sought retrospectively for the erection of an external flu. The site is located within the traditional suburban centre where uses such as restaurants are permitted. There are a number of uses along this stretch of road including two public houses at either end of this terrace of units. One pub, the Richmond, is located between the proposed use and the nearest residential property in Maritime Park. Given this and the fact that the area is designated as a traditional suburban centre, the proposed change of use is considered to be acceptable. A number of conditions are also proposed that would ensure immunity is protected, including a noise insulation scheme and hours of, of operation. The application is recommended for approval. There is a qualifying petition um, in association with this application. Thank you, Matthew. Is the uh, lead petitioner here? No? Okay, is there a ward council here? No? Can I open this up to committee, please? Pat. Uh, just a question, really. I mean, this uh, this application is in my ward, so I'm familiar with the with the location, and I did go around and inspect it the other day. And I'd just like a bit of clarification from uh, Environmental Health, if we could, about the status of the flu, its proximity to residential properties, and what we're doing to ensure that uh, the flu, when it is operational, will um, will meet will meet uh, the necessary requirements. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I visited the site the other day as well, and um, the initial plans when it came in, the, the flu hadn't um, been started to be constructed. Uh, the flu that you see in place at the moment has been partially completed, hence the, uh, the retrospective um, uh, uh, application. I've spoken um, with the applicant's family, 
um, and looked at the plans. There is condition five in there for a suitable scheme for human extraction. Uh, the the uh, initial uh, plans show that the the uh, exit will be half a metre above eaves. We would normally say it must be at least one metre above eaves. There was also concerns uh, when I went out the other day to see the, uh, the terminal, uh, the blue discharge terminal. It's what we would commonly call, uh, it's commonly referred to as a Chinese hat, which would actually knock the fumes down. So again, from the fume um, uh, point of view, we would be recommending a different type of uh, finish on the top there. Also, while I was out of sight, across the car park, there is a, an existing Chinese takeaway, a uh, very similar sort of distance that has an uh, extract system in. Uh, it's been there for around about 12 years, and we've never had any complaints to do with odors or noise from there. It is a slightly different um, terminal discharge at the end there. So, again, I have details of the, uh, the applicant, and I will be um, passing on information regarding the, the happy board. Could I just ask you to clarify the distance? Uh, we, would, we would recommend that it discharges no less than one metre above the eaves level. Okay, I think it was it the distance from the eaves level, or the distance from the housing? Well, I think my original concern was the, the distance from the actual housing, from the, the residential unit. Right, so just clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, again, the existing Chinese takeaway that is across the, the entrance road to the, the um, sheltered housing is a similar distance to the, uh, the proposed stack that's going in. It's a slightly different um, terminal velocity uh, on the top there. However, we've had no complaints from there. Also, if um, fumes or odors do start to cause a nuisance, we can have. Um, through stamp usage, we can put, we would recommend or require um, more efficient filters to be put in to stop any uses. Thank you. Uh, just uh, for clarification, uh, Pat, I know on the representations it actually says that the um, it was five metres away. But on page 55 of your report, um, the third paragraph up, it does actually say it's 13 metres. Ron, did you want to speak? Yes, just one uh, Chair. Um, that is an issue with the environmental purposes. Is that a separate issue or a separate plan issue? Or is that because, and why is that concerned not getting the documents that we thought? The, the, the environmental health is statutory consulting. Yeah, but why are they not responding to the, 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 the document only? Sorry, through you, Chair. Sorry, through you, Chair. Um, we have been consulted and we put a memo through to planning, and from that, conditions have gone through. One of which is Condition 5, which is a suitable scheme of fuel extraction and should be submitted. When we initially went out and viewed the property, there was no fuel extraction at all. Right? So, no, just saying it's no, it's, it's no objection subject to conditions. Right, so that's the legal you would then ensure that it complied with. Yes, yeah, so we've recommended those conditions and they've been in as yeah. for um, recommendation yeah. Yeah. Okay, that, that's absolutely right, Ron. And if you look at conditions four, five, and six, um, they all cover those under the, the noise condition uh, raised into representation that's covered by conditions from. And I think that, 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 that's uh, the good reason for having site visits because you can make a better uh, uh, view of it. Okay, um, Ian. Thanks, Chair. As, as this is a retrospective application for the flu, um, can I ask, were there any pre application discussions for the change of use? Which would you address the applicant to the fact that this required planning uh, planning permission before it was uh, installed? There was no pre application. Sorry? No pre application. No pre application. Okay, thank you. 
Stuart. Yes, uh, without wishing to appear a pedant uh, on these on these matters, I, I fully concur with, with with what certain my mouth has said in terms of the um, um, the effect of condition five, which it, which is to install the uh, the flu, um, so that so that it complies with the guidance of control road, uh, etc. However. I had noticed when I, when I looked up the past, I think, for plans on the council's websites, um, they, they, they just didn't comply. So it's always like a pencil sketch, which, which leads me back down to condition two, um, which requires the development to be carried out in accordance with the approved plans. Just need, uh, if it's carried out in accordance with the approved plans, then it will comply with condition five. I don't, I don't know that might sound pedantic, but it's those, those sorts of things that so we pull from the, for example, the plan show the clearance from the eaves to be half a metre, whereas the guidance of terminal only requires, requires that to be one metre. Um, either then the plans need to be amended or the condition needs to be changed um, to say something else. We need to make it clear for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, you would just put at the beginning of condition five, notwithstanding the approved plans, a, a suitable scheme still needs to be submitted. So we would just add at, at the beginning of condition five, notwithstanding the approved plans. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Stuart, could I just ask you to turn your microphone off, please? It's okay, no problem. Um, okay, the officer's recommendation is to approve this subject to the conditions listed. All those in favour of approval? Sorry, I've done it again. I've, I'm surprised. Can I have a mover, please? Sorry. Thank you. And, and Tony seconded that. So, uh, all those in favour of approval? Mm -hmm. Subject to the conditions listed. That's unanimous. That's carried. Thank you. Can we now revert to order? Um, and we've got agenda item four, which is pages seven to sixteen in your packs, which is Bland and Conway Street, Birkenhead. Matthew, can we have a presentation, please? mixed-use development that will consist of community, commercial, retail and or financial uses on the ground floor and residential use above by way of 132 one and two bedroom apartments. The site is located in the key town centre of Bergenhead and is currently a vacant site that is used for car parking. The site was previously occupied by a cinema and bingo hall. The site has a mix of uses adjacent to it, including some entertainment uses on the opposite side of Conway Street and retail to the south in the form of House of Fraser. I think it uh, describes it as Debenhams in the report, but it is House of Fraser. The building will be seven storeys and will occupy a prominent position within the street scene. It is modern and contemporary in design and the use of a high quality palette of materials will ensure the building establish itself in the street scene. The development is located in an extremely sustainable location within easy access to the main bus terminal and Conway Park railway station. There are also a large number of amenities within walking distance of the development. Additionally, some car parking has been provided within the scheme. There would be a minimum of 10% affordable housing required as part of this proposal. However, a viability assessment has been submitted that demonstrates that the scheme would not be viable with affordable housing provision and this has been independently assessed on behalf of the Council and the conclusions of that assessment are accepted. The site sits approximately 30 metres west of the southernmost boundary of Hamilton Square Conservation Area. The Conway Centre opposite is a Grade 2 listed building which is located approximately 35 metres on the opposite side of Conway Street. The design, scale and massing of the proposed development is not considered to detrimentally impact on the character or setting of either the conservation area 
or the listed building, and the development will read within the overall context of the town centre setting. The application is recommended for approval. There's no petition of objection in connection with these proposals. There are, however, a couple of amendments to conditions, if I could just read them out. Um, we're seeking to amend condition 18 to read, the ground floor use hereby permitted shall be made available for commercial occupation and marketed for its intended use before the 40th apartment has been occupied. Um, and condition 12 should read, construction of the development authorised by this permission shall not begin until the local planning authority has approved in writing a full scheme of works for the construction of the new vehicle accesses from the highway and amendments to the existing highway made necessary by this development, including new vehicle crossing accesses in accordance with LPA commercial crossing specifications, all necessary road markings, traffic signs and street furniture, and associated traffic regulation orders, and the reinstatement to standard footway levels of all existing vehicle crossings made obsolete by this development. The approved work shall be completed in accordance with the local planning authority written approval and prior to occupation of the development. Thank you, Matthew. Is there a board councillor here to speak on this? No. Can I open this up to committee, please? Pat? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, um, I'm very pleased that this has been amended. This application has been amended. We've now got two lifts rather than one, and we have um, designated cycle storage. And also, we know where the refuse storage would be. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, if I may. Um, first of all, in terms of the affordable housing, uh, we've got the usual situation here where there's viability assessment. We've accepted that the scheme would not be viable without affordable housing. Normally I would have expected to see a commuted sum in lieu of that, so I'm just wondering why that's not the case uh, in, in this particular uh, application. And secondly, um, again this is in my ward, so I'm familiar with the area, but I'm also familiar with all the other purpose-built blocks of flats in the area, and there isn't a single purpose-built block of flats in my ward that that has recycling facilities for residents. No residents who live in the purpose-built blocks of flats are able to recycle their waste. So I note that um, condition 17 deals with um, the disposal of refuse, and I would like to know if we could consider amending that uh, to include uh, where it says, um, so prior to the first occupation of the dwellings, arrangements for the storage and disposal, disposal of refuse, including facilities for recycling, etc., uh, etc. Et if we could amend the condition to include that, uh, to encourage the, the um, applicant that I'm sure all members would agree that we would like to see residents, whether they live in houses or blocks of flats, be able to, uh, to recycle their waste. So those two points, thank you. Thank you, Pat. I'll uh, pass this to Matthew to comment. The um, financial viability assessment that was submitted with the application um, looked at both on-site and off-site provision of affordable housing by way of a commuted sum. Um, and that viability assessment found that the scheme wouldn't be viable with, um, with either of, of um, on-site provision or off-site provision. I mean, it's not just a case of the council accepting the conclusions of that. We have had it independently appraised. And in fact, the appraisal that was done on behalf of the council found that the um, uh, the sort of financial viability of the scheme was was significantly lower than what had been put, put forward by the uh, by the applicants. So that's why there isn't a commuted sum in this instance. Um, in terms of condition 17 being amended, we don't have any specific policies um, within the council, or certainly in the you know, in the in the UDP that relates to um, recycling, but I don't see that there's any harm in adding um, including recycling facilities into that condition. And, you know, we can test that by, by including it in the condition if, if members are so minded. Pass. Well, just to follow up on that, I'm very grateful that we can amend the condition. I think clearly our policies are deficient in this respect. And could we 
Could we do something about it? It would just be my plea to all members. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, I remember when uh, the requirement for affordable units was, uh, the threshold was introduced at 10, because developments of uh, 10 or fewer units was felt to be not viable. Uh, I'm surprised that the development of 132 units with business units on the ground floor is not viable. Um, I think that sends the wrong signal uh, to developers, uh, particularly in an area that we've heard is sustainable uh, for development, uh, particularly in an area where there is housing need. Uh, so I'm disappointed that the applicant hasn't felt able to come up with a scheme that offers affordable housing on a scheme that offers 132 units. I'm quite surprised by that, but I accept what the uh, officer has said in terms of the viability assessment. Uh, what I am concerned about is that we've seen a number of developments over the last couple of years where we have commercial units on the ground floor with residential units above, the developer sells the units above, and the commercial units on the ground floor are left vacant or boarded up for years. Uh, can the uh, officer, uh, can the director of planning please uh, confirm what the amended condition was on 18 that would prevent that happening in this case, please? Uh, thank you through you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think when we looked at the condition again, we felt it wasn't specific enough and it was quite onerous in what we were asking for. So the amended condition now asks for the, uh, the commercial occupation and to be marketed for that use um, before the 40th apartment is occupied. So it's essentially the same thing, but it's more, it's more detailed and specific in what we're, what we're requiring. So it's before the 40th apartment is, is, is occupied. In that case, what happens if the developer doesn't comply with that request? What do we do? He'd be in breach of that condition for which we would um, issue a breach, of, uh, a breach of condition notice. And that would be enforced? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. David. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd be grateful again if um, officers could put up a location plan or a plan layout of the building itself. When we discussed this a while ago, we did raise concern that there appeared to be one lift serving the whole building. That now seems to have been amended to the extent we're told that there's two lifts um, now serving the building. It may not be a planning issue, and if it's not, then I'm sure you'll tell us. But the lift sizes are such that they would appear to be personnel lifts and incapable of taking on board furniture. I would just like um, the officers to comment on whether that is a planning issue that's been considered, whether it's an amenity issue that's been considered, or whether it is something that would have to be satisfied under building control legislation regulations at some future occasion. In simple terms, I've been involved in the construction industry for 40 odd years and I've never built something of this size with one passenger size lift serving a building of this shape and size. So I'd really just like a brief comment on that because I am concerned that we are in fact potentially approving something which has lack of amenity in terms of access to the upper floors for furniture and for individuals. Thank you. Uh, thank you through you, Chair. I mean, essentially the short answer is that's not really a planning consideration. I mean, it, it is a building control um, consideration that would be looked at as part of any building regulations application. But how um, potential occupants of these flats would get their furniture in and out of out of them isn't something that we would consider as part of the, the planning application, I'm afraid. But there are two there are two lifts and there are a number of stairs that give access to the upper floors. Thank you. Any other comments? Stuart Hill, Hill Street. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, also share my invitation at the lack of uh, affordable housing and the fact that you know developers are allowed currently uh, to keep their viability assessments secret from uh, from public and indeed member um, scrutiny not the standard that um, we have chartered, a firm of chartered surveyors uh, who uh, look over them for us. But from my point of view, you know, a chartered surveyor will look at it. The building costs, etc., are more or less a fixed fee, aren't they? Uh, the difference uh, will tend to be in the value of the land um, and secret valuation assessments tend, are tending to increase the value of land and therefore the, uh, the, the price of property. I would be more satisfied you know, if somebody could say to me, the bulk of the reason that it isn't viable 
is rather to do with land value. It's to do with you know land with uh, you know bringing the land back yeah. into you know where it can yeah. and that. He's like, not the right way to approach things. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it was genuine thing as opposed as opposed to uh, the profit margin that the landowner is making on it, which the developer is needed uh, to pay. Nevertheless, that's where we are. Government has promised uh, to bring forward new regulations on um, on making these things more open, and I know some London authorities have already. So certainly, I, that, that weighs in in my mind. Having said that, you know, I think great weight should be you know afforded to the principle of. Um, of, of getting development in, uh, in in this area and, and getting people living in this area again. And, you know, one of the reasons it's it's a low percentage, 10%, is because there is a fair amount of social housing in the area as it stands. Uh, one thing I would just like to is there's a large uh, development, I think one of the largest blocks of flats that we've, uh, uh, that we, we've looked at. Page 12, um, the um, assessment by the Raise of fire and rescue services is effect. Uh, and as they were a, 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 a statutory consultee, um, page nine indicates that uh, fire and rescue did have comments to make which are deemed to be uh, non planning related. But in, in, the, um, you know, in the aftermath of, of, of issues um, with large um, buildings, I think safety, um, and particularly fire safety, is something that ought to be to the fore of our mind. Can, can we know what those issues are and whether they're, they're, they're significant and substantial? Sorry, just through you, Chair. I'm not sure it would be appropriate for me to comment on something that's governed by the building regulations process. It's not part of the planning application. If building, if building regulations find that they're, they're not satisfying certain criteria, then they won't get, they won't get their relevant permits. All, all we're being asked to do is consider whether this is an appropriate use of the land. That's what planning is, 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 um, is concerned with. It, it, it's not about the detail of, of, of building regulations. So I can't comment on something that's outside of the remit of planning, I'm afraid. Thank you, Matthew. Ron? Yeah, just on, uh, it might be a privilege to watch you, it's just on Plan Edition 8. Um, what does it mean by a window? What do we mean by a window? What do we mean by a window? What do we mean by a window? Does that have to then create a fire risk? Or has it been a fire, a new fire hazard that if somebody's trying to execute it? I'm sure there will be a lot more than one window because, yes. um, and there will be a, a window that the, there is some escape through but um, sometimes they have to be restricted for, for various reasons whether like, it's overlooking or noise or yeah, we do we do have those those restrictions um, attached to some of uh, the planning applications. Okay, any more points? Stuart. Uh, I'll be saying in terms of building control that if the fire if the fire and rescue authority is not satisfied with the uh, means of, of uh, well, egress, I guess would be their main concern, then the development would not go ahead. I'm, I'm just conscious that. I appreciate what the Prime Minister says about the principle of development. I, I'm not opposed to the principle of residential development in this area. However, in the conditions, we ask it to be built to accept to the plans that have been submitted. And I think, you know, my concern, and you know, one's raised an issue with a condition which has come from the fire uh, uh, authority, that there seems to be on page 12.